Welcome to the second session. Um, we have Andrew, he's going to give us a presentation on there will be data, scrapping the web with Python. Scrapping the web, sorry, with Python. You can take it away. Um, good morning. I've, I've always been kind of a little bit intrigued about working on a Mac, um, but I hadn't really planned on doing it this way of sort of suddenly having to work on a Mac spontaneously. So I, I can't sort of vouch for my technical competence during the course of this talk. Anyway, so here's a hypothetical. I'm developing some new financial product and my intention is to market that product to politicians. And I've got the call center all set up and they're waiting to start calling people. Right? But I need to provide them with some sort of contact details so they can start haranguing the politicians. How do I go about doing that? How do I get a, a set of phone numbers for a bunch of politicians? I'll tell you. Parliament actually lists all the contact details, email addresses, phone numbers for all the members of Parliament. And I reckon that's probably a pretty good place to start, right? 450 people that we can start selling our product to. How are we going to do, do that? Well, scrape their website. Okay, so that's, the, that's what I'm going to be talking about, web scraping. And if I can find the page down, that's good enough. Okay, so I'm Andrew. I work for a company called Exegetic Analytics. We do data science consulting. We do some training. And we also build quite a lot of bespoke web scrapers, which is why I'm talking about this today. So. What do I mean by web scraping? The idea here is that we automatically, well, we, we build a system that will go and systematically and automatically extract information from a website and then record it in some sort of structured format that makes it easy for you to use. Okay, and why would we want to do this? Well, many websites, like the website for the members of parliament, have a stash of really useful potentially quite valuable information. And there are, two particular, there are two potential applications here. One is building a new data set from scratch, and the other is taking some existing data set that you have and augmenting it with some other data that you acquire off the internet. Okay, but I'm, in the back of your head, I, I think maybe some of you are thinking, well, I can do this manually, right? I can actually go to the Members of Parliament site and like, extract this information, and for sure you can. If it's just a single page, like a Wikipedia page with a table, you can go and copy and paste that directly into Excel. But if we're talking about tens or hundreds or thousands of pages, then this becomes a really onerous task, the kind of task that no one should have to do. Okay, so how do we go about doing this? Well, if the site has an API, then clearly they've actually set things up for you. They want you to access their data. And so it's in your best interests and the interests of the site to use that API. Right? It's going to be much easier for you and it's got to produce much less load on the site. But if there is no API, you've got to scrape it. So what are our options for scraping? Well, there are actually some commercial scraping uh, offerings. So you can go along to a variety of sites on the internet uh, and sign up to have them scrape a, a website for you. And, and this is, in, in principle, quite a good thing to do because it's quick and easy. Uh, you know, you can have your scraping done in a very short period of time. But there are some downsides to this. And they are, firstly, that you, you never have access to the code, right? So the people who do the scraping for you, they've got to hang on to that. That's their IP. They will run that scraper for you. You will pay for the service, right? And if the site that you're scraping has changes, and websites change all the time, then you'll probably need to pay them to upgrade their scraper to take into account that the site has been modified. So potentially in the long run, this may end up being quite uh, an expensive way of going about doing it. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative apparently is a blank page where there was a picture. It's no longer there. Um, we have some tools. And these, to my mind, are, are really the only good options for web scraping. So R over on the left-hand side, and I'll tell you in the interest of full disclosure, I am an R man, and Python. Okay, 
but obviously I'm going to be talking about Python today. Another page, I have no idea what goes there, but that's just, I guess, right, ah, yes. On this page was a very beautiful illustration, actually made by my daughter, which basically shows you how information gets from a web server to your browser. And there are three things that get transmitted. So there's the HTML, which is the, the body of the page. Generally, that's where the data that you're after is. is. Okay, and then there's a, normally a separate file, which is the CSS. And we're going to be talking about CSS quite a bit shortly. But that CSS tells the browser how to make the page look pretty. And then there is quite often some JavaScript. And this is where things get a little bit interesting. So from the perspective of scraping, there are two types of sites. There's a static site. And this is fully rendered on the server. In other words, the server puts together all of the HTML and then sends that to your browser. Now, these are the ones that are easy to scrape. As it happens, members of Parliament site, totally static. Then there are the dynamic sites. And these have some sort of framework of HTML, but then a whole bunch of JavaScript. And what happens is then your, um, your browser will execute that JavaScript, which will then go and retrieve all of that data and dynamically build the page in the browser. Now, this is perfectly feasible for scraping, but it's just a little bit more challenging. We will not be looking at this today. OK, another beautiful slide, completely screwed by the fact that I'm operating off a stiffy disk. Um, what do you need to know to do this? Do you need to know HTML? Yeah, you do. Do you need to know CSS? Most certainly. Do you need to know JavaScript? Fortunately not, because that would be a bridge too far for me, I'm afraid. OK, so. I am DataWiki. Again, something's missing, but we'll just skip over that for now. And let's talk about CSS. So cascading style sheets. What is CSS? Well, it's the thing that makes the internet beautiful, right? So there's a very clear partition between content that's your HTML, and styling, that's the CSS, OK? Now, this may be very hard to believe, but when I first encountered the internet back in, in 1993 or 1994, this was what it looks like, like mosaic. And like, this was a pretty good web page. And if you compare that to the way that web pages look now, it's chalk and cheese, right? This was very, very utilitarian. And the reason for that was that the internet initially was built for scientists, and they just wanted to convey information. They didn't really care too much about aesthetics. OK, but CSS came along and started to make things really beautiful. And we're not actually too concerned about how that works. What we want to do is use CSS as a tool to target portions of a web page. Because what your browser does is it gets that CSS file, and it has a whole load of rules in it. And those rules tell it to target portions of the page and apply styling to them. You're going to see what I mean in, in just a moment. OK, we don't worry about the styling. We're going to use those same selectors to identify portions of the page to scrape. OK, so schematically, this is what um, a CSS rule would look like. So you've got a selector or one or more selectors, and you've got some declarations. Now, the selectors target a portion of a page. The declarations tell the browser what to do with that. So let's take a look at the selector zoo, ways that we can target elements on a page. So the first, and probably the simplest, is just to use the tag name. So HTML consists of an opening, uh, normally an opening tag, some content, and then a closing tag. And these tags have various names. So for example, if it's paragraph text, then you would use the p tag. If it's a table, you'd use the table tag. So a, a rule to target a paragraph tag might look like this. So you have the p for paragraph, and then the declaration color red. Your browser will go and identify all the paragraphs on the page, make them red. Right, so this is the simplest and, and easiest uh, tag. Then you've got uh, identifiers. So you can use these identifiers to pick out a unique element on the page. So any one element, any one identifier can only point to a single element. And in CSS, these are indicated by a, a hash. So 
hash introduction, for example, will target this tag over here, which has an ID of introduction. If you're aiming to get some content of a website and there is an identifier, you're already off to a good start because it's very, very easy to target that component. Then you have classes. Classes are like identifiers, but they're just a little bit more general. They allow you to target a whole selection of tags. So, for example, over there on the left-hand side in the CSS, I've got two classes, big and huge, and they would target these two paragraphs. So this paragraph here, class big, would be targeted by the first rule, and this one, class huge, would be targeted by the second rule. Then there are a couple of other things. So for example, you can group these selectors together. So for example, over there, you've got h1, comma, h2 in the CSS, and that will target both h1, so like chapter level t um, headings, and h2, section level headings. It'll target both of them. And you also have this idea of descendants. So um, you can think of an HTML document very much like a tree, in that you've got tags nested within tags nested within tags. And you can use this hierarchical relationship to dig down into the page. And there, there are two types of relationships that you can use. So the one is just a simple descendant. And so, for example, in the CSS over on the left there, we've got a dot outer. Now, you may recall that this indicates that we are targeting the outer class. And then within that, or after it, we've got a P for paragraph. So this is going to target a paragraph tag whenever it occurs within a, another tag that has got this outer class. So for example, here, we've got a div with class outer. And inside that, we've got two paragraph tags that would both be targeted by that rule. And one final, um, well, there are many, many other selectors. Uh, just This is the one that I'm going to be talking about last before we move on to actually doing some stuff. And this is a child. So a, a, a descendant can be anywhere in the hierarchy. A child is going to be directly beneath the current tag. So for example, if I have outer greater than P, this means I'm selecting a paragraph tag whenever it is the child, the direct descendant of another tag with the outer class. Great. Okay, so let's let's get on to doing some stuff. Now I had this these notebooks working on my machine in in Jupiter this morning. I've scurried to cross move them across onto Colab. Hopefully they'll still be fine. Um, I'm going to run you through how one would go about scraping the members of Parliament site. So here here are is a selection of our most attractive uh, members of Parliament and. What I'm going to do is just scroll down, if I can figure that out. It really shouldn't be this difficult, right? Or I really shouldn't be this stupid. I beg your pardon? Two fingers. OK, that's helpful. What I need to do right now is just get the mouse across there. No. Oh. I just want to scroll the page down, but not the whole page down. The arrow keys. OK, nice. That seems to just do really big chunks. OK, so obviously this is a Jupyter notebook, and I'm loading up a couple of packages. So let's just talk about those for a moment. Um, maybe I need to make this a bit bigger as well, which is going to be the next trick. Um, command, command, shift plus. Yes. I'm going to be like a Mac expert in no time. I'll be consulting on Macs, in fact. <laughs> OK, so um, we put in a bunch of packages that are just like general Python things. And then at the bottom here, we're bringing in two packages that are scraping specific. So the one is requests. And this is also kind of a general purpose package. And this is going to allow us to initiate a request to a web server. The web server is going to send back some stuff to us. We're then going to take that stuff and we're going to use the other package, which is beautiful soup, to interrogate that content. OK. So um, let's get to the page in question. So this is the link for the members of Parliament site. OK, so there we go. And you can see there are a whole lot of them. and 
each one of these um, cells, it's not really readily apparent on the projector. When you hover over them, they, they kind of highlighted, which indicates that they're a link. So if you click on any one of these, uh, it'll take you through to that person's page. So there, for example, we have this young lady. And our objective here is going to be to extract some information. So we're going to want to have her name so that when the call center calls, they're going to be, uh, hello, is this Alexandra? And of course, we're going to need her phone number. No problem. There we go. And we want her email address. And like, clearly, that is her personal email address. So it'll work very nicely. So we're good. OK. So let's just go back to my notebook over here. Um, I'm going to set up a couple of constants. So here I have the, the base URL for, for the, the page with all of the, the profiles on it. And this is for that particular lady that we were looking on just a moment ago. So we're going to start off by just basically going through the steps of scraping the bits off her page, and then we're going to build a function to automate it, and then we're going to systematically do it across everyone. Um, OK, so there we go. So this is, this is our first step, um, is to use the requests library. We need to actually get the content from the web server. And so we execute a, a get request, uh, and providing it with the, the URL for that page. A GET request is, is essentially exactly what your browser is doing when you type in a URL and press the Go button, OK? So to go and retrieve the contents of that page. Just the HTML, right? So you're not going to get the CSS. It's not going to pull down the JavaScript. You're just getting the, the HTML body of the page. And it's always prudent when, you get, when that GET function returns to check that it was successful. So we get a check on the status code. And we see that it's 200. And here I've got a, a very small selection of possible values. Right? 200 is what you want. Any of those 400s or 500 type values indicate that there's some problem with retrieving that page. But so this, this suggests that that was a successful operation. And we can also take a look at the headers, because along with the, the actual HTML content that comes back, we also get this header information, which is kind of metadata about the HTML. And so here we can see uh, probably the most pertinent thing for us right now is the content type. We want to ensure that we're getting back HTML. So it says their content type is text HTML. So um, that looks good. I would probably just go and pull out that actual key from the dictionary and check it. So we're going to build that logic into our function. And now we can actually go and think about looking at the content, the body of, of, the, of the response. So that's held in this content uh, attribute. And if you just interrogate that, then you'll see there's this very, very long string with lots of embedded new lines. So in principle, if we actually printed that, we'd get a, a nice document. Um, but what you'll also see here is that you, you get some sort of hint that this is going to be tag soup, because we've got a tag there, another tag there. You'll see in a moment there are a bunch of tags. Luckily for us, we don't actually have to worry about navigating the soup. Uh, Beautiful Soup is going to do that for us. So, whoops. We're going to take the response and pass it into the Beautiful Soup constructor. And hang on to the results. We just got to call that HTML for the moment. And then take a look. And the, the representation of our document now is quite a lot neater. We can actually <laughs> OK. How do I not sc scroll that block and just scroll the entire document? <laughs> I'm feeling my age right now. <laughs> Okay, I see you doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, sir. That's awesome. Um, okay, so this is what our tag soup looks like, and you can see, I mean, literally, there just there's some massive tags. This is not very, very, it's not very informative because there's just far too much information. We'd have to make some sense of that. I'm going to try my new trick. Ooh, look at that. This is going to be a long morning. No. <laughs> OK. 
Okay. I feel an expletive coming. I'm pushing it down. Okay. So. <laughs> um, right. So now I'm going to write a function so we can do this systematically across the entire page. So we've got the get request. We pull out the status code. We've got to check in on the status code and ultimately um, retrieve return the content of our, our beautiful soup object if we were successful, and otherwise return none. And we can give that a quick, quick test on um, a couple of URLs. OK. Yo. OK. And this is thank you, Google Colab, for hiding my cells. OK. So, um, what we really want to do now is start addressing content on that page. So if I want to, for example, get her name, then I'm going to go and right click. Oh, OK. Again, F12 maybe, no. Anyone have a mouse to lend me? <laughs> Adrian, you're a lifesaver, sir. Now let's see if you can figure out how to pair a Bluetooth mouse on a Mac. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. <sighs> Fantastic. He says, knowing that it's not going to be quite that simple. OK. Um, inspect element, that's what we want. OK. And mm, OK. So um, I'm expecting the element that is her name. And what you can see down here is that it's highlighted the content of the HTML that corresponds to her name. If I right click on that and choose copy and copy and CSS selector, it will give me back an H1 because in this case, the selector for that tag is H1. There's only one H1 on the page. So that's nice and simple. And so back in Python, what I would do is use my beautiful soup object called person and I would run the select method, providing it's the CSS selector, and that gives me back a tag. And you can see immediately here that I've now got the tag with her name embedded in it. Of course, I don't want to have those tags anymore. I just actually want the content. I'll show you how we get that content out momentarily. Um, an important thing to note here is that this select method is going to identify all of the tags on the page that meet that criterion. So if there was more than one H1 tag, I would get a list of, of items. So to get around this, what we can do is use the select one method. Okay, and this will just get, grab the first matching tag on the page and return it. That's precisely what we want. And now to get the content out of that, we just take a look at the text attribute and we just get back her name. And this is where my OCD kicks in heavily because you'll notice on the left hand side there there's that, that white space it just grinds me okay but you've got to expect this whenever you're working with html it's going to be a little bit messy but we can get rid of that very very easily by just running the strip method on that string and we end up with a very nicely formatted uh, version of her name so the next thing we want to do is get her affiliation right we, we want to know what party she's with so i'm going to go back to her page and I'm going to um, there we go. So she's with the DA. I guess you knew that already. Okay. Um, and I'm going to click on that and go to inspect element. And it'll take me down to the relevant tag. And then on this tag I can once again go right click, copy, CSS selector. And the selector that I get back will be precisely that string there. And you'll notice that it begins with a period. So this means that that's a class that's been applied to that tag. 
And we take the results of that. We're using select one again, just in case there are multiple affiliations on the page. And we get back this very, very busy HTML tag. You can see there's a lot of information here that we don't actually want. Um, but <laughs> um, what we're going to do now is just interrogate it and grab out the text. And there we have the, the DA. So we now got two pieces of information about this lady. And I'm going to scroll down and skip over that. We now want to get her email address. It's exactly the same story again. So I need to go to her, pa to her page, find her email address. I right click on it. I go and copy the selector. So you can see that this is kind of the same recipe over and over again. Something that's worth pointing out here is that, that you don't need to go into developer tools. There's a very, very handy uh, plugin for Chrome and probably for Firefox too called the Selector Gadget. And with the Selector Gadget, it's super easy to pick out the selectors for particular items on, on a page. It's very nice because um, sometimes if you're taking the DevTools route, you'll get a selector which will actually end up targeting a bunch of tags on the page. With select a gadget, you can select a, the tag you want. It'll then highlight all the tags that will be selected by the current selector. And you can then turn off the ones that you don't want until you get precisely the selector that will just give you back the information that you want. OK, so we're going to grab her email address as well. And we can see here that we get a list because she's got two email addresses on the page. Now, we could actually craft our selector to only give us back the first email address. But I think it might be quite handy to have alternatives. right? If we email her on her personal one and she just ignores it, then we're going to hit her up where she works. Um, so we're going to take both of those. Uh, I'm, going to take, I'm going to use uh, a list comprehension to convert them into a list and clean them up, and then finally concatenate them together uh, with, a, with a semicolon in the middle. So I now have a, a string of email addresses that just happens to have two entries in it. We do the same thing for the phone number, right? Same thing. Find out the selector. In this case, getting the phone number is actually a little bit more tricky because the phone number is basically just a part of this list structure on the left-hand side of the page. And you can take a, create, create a selector that will target it for this particular individual, but it uses the fact that it's the fourth entry in the list. And this is likely to break. Okay, If you go to another page where the phone number is not the fourth entry, it's not going to work. So a, a very handy selector that I didn't talk about earlier is this one here. And it's basically it's, it's selecting on an attribute. So this tag is an anchor tag, A. Whenever there's a link on a website, it's an anchor tag. And the link will have an attribute, an href attribute, that provides the URL that that link is pointing to. And this selector is saying, um, give me back any anchor tag where the href, so the URL, uh, begins with TEL colon. So this is the, the telephone number URL. So this, if you've done the HTML and, and you've written like an email colon, that's like the email URL. This is the telephone URL. OK, so we grabbed her telephone number as well. And so this is doing all these steps individually. We can take them and wrap them up in a function right? that goes and does all of those things and stores the results in a dictionary. A dictionary is going to turn out to be rather convenient because I'm going to go and hit all of those members of parliament. I'm then going to have a list of dictionaries. And I'm going to use pandas to take those and convert them into a data frame. So I'll end up having a data frame with all of this data. OK, so let's see our, how well our function works. So on the lady we've just been looking at, her name, her party, her phone number, and her email. And there are a couple of others there uh, for whom it seems to work pretty well. So the next thing we need to do is systematically do this across the entire website. And this means that we now need to go back to the original page, which is basically the directory of all of the members of parliament and iterates across all of them. And the code is here. I will be sharing it this, um, in my GitHub later today. So you're welcome to browse it at leisure. But the crux of this is that you, you need to, to write a function that's going to go and iterate over the page. And for each of those members of parliament, apply the function that we've just seen to retrieve their individual details. 
and then ultimately go and concatenate everything together into a data frame. And this is what the data looks like when, when we're done. So all 450-odd members of parliament with all of their contact details. I don't feel remotely bad about scraping this because it's totally public information. Um, and uh, yeah, so and then when I'm done, and of course this is worth talking about for the moment, like brace yourself, change is coming. I'll return to that right now. Um, once I've done the scrape, I'm going to go and stash it in a database. And this notebook just stores it in, in a SQLite database. So returning to this uh, Game of Thrones meme, because no talk is really complete without. Um, why, why do I say brace yourself, change is coming? Because, well, for two reasons. One, um, Parliament does not appear to be a static object. People enter, people exit. So, you know, we might in principle want to rerun this scraper from time to time to ensure that our, our information is up to date. So having a script where we can just press go and update the entire database would be quite handy. Um, th the other thing is that the other place where you'll find change is that the layout of websites are getting constantly tweaked. So having a script that you can just go back and change the various elements that correspond to the changes in the site, super handy. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, we have room for a couple of questions, three at most. So while the mic is going around, I'd just like to say thank you for being here to share in my Mac learning experience. <laughs> uh, thanks for the talk, Andrew. Um, I just want to know how easy is this to do asynchronously, and how do you deal with um, throttling? Um, so, I <laughs> hmm. so doing it asynchronously is, is fairly straightforward, um, but I, I, I don't know that, I mean, if, you, if you're thinking about having, launching multiple connections against the same site simultaneously, yeah, I mean, yes, so for sure, you can certainly do that. However, I, I would, for ethical reasons, advise against that. Because, I mean, you, you want your scraping to be inobtrusive for two reasons. One, you don't want to really, you don't want the people who are hosting the website to become aware of the fact that you're scraping. Because if you do, they will probably put measures in place to make it more difficult for you. And, and the other is, it's just, it's considerate because, you know, there are lots of other people who are trying to access that website. Maybe not so much for members of parliament. But, I mean, take a lot, for example. And, and if you're hitting it really, really hard, it's going to uh, make their experience poorer. And uh, dealing with throttling, I think that that kind of relates to the same thing. So normally, for example, if you take a look at this notebook, ultimately when I, when I scrape the members of Parliament site, I am going to be hitting each individual member and then pausing for a few seconds in between and then hitting the next one. It means that I don't get the information for all 450 members within a minute or two. It's going to take me half an hour. But I mean, really, it's just half an hour. I'm going to go away and drink coffee for that time. Um. Yeah, uh, I wanted to ask, how do you like track changes? Uh, can you get can you set up set it up so that you automatically get notified or you see when when they update their website or their layout? So, I'm there may well be tools for that. What we will normally do when we build a scraper is it'll be logging data to, to a database and we will build some analytics on top of that, uh, which will generate a report that's either emailed to us or sent via Telegram. And then we check that report every day and we just look for changes in the number of hits we're getting. Or you know, if it goes to zero, then you know something substantial has changed. Um, I'll take one more question here, then Andrew's gonna be here. Um, don't want to delay the rest of the team for the coffee break. So I'll take one more question from the back then. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, your Mac learning curve was awesome. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you mentioned that there's some of these like adversarial techniques that people use to avoid scraping. Um, and sometimes that's legitimate and sometimes that's not. Um, can you maybe share like what some of those look like and when you might be bumping into those? Um, well, I mean, just making your, your website JavaScript driven is, is going to escalate the level of difficulty quite significantly. Um, pro probably the largest burden for, for us in terms of scraping is if people put things like captures onto their sites. You know, that's 
that means basically you've got to have some sort of modeling that's going to decrypt that capture and allow you to proceed on the page. And then also, you know, instances where, um, for example, they require you to, to log in. I mean, if you want to do systematic scraping on, on LinkedIn, for example, you've got to have like a, a subscription for that to make sense. And then LinkedIn seems to have pages where their behavior actually changes dynamically, which is just, it's weird and very, very difficult to deal with. So, I mean, LinkedIn is a great example. They know that they are being scraped, so they, they have quite a lot of measures in place to try and minimize that, you know. I wouldn't even contemplate that. <laughs> um, thank you very much, Andrew. A uh, round of applause for Andrew once again. Um, we're going to take.